We have now begun constitutional negotiations at Cadessa, but the uncertainty relating to the process, the violence that had occurred, the hostile attitude of the ANC during 1990 and 1991 was beginning to have an impact on the white electorate. Toward the end of 1991, the National Party lost an important by-election in the town of Virginia to the Conservative Party. Then a big test would, they knew would come with a by-election in Potchefstroom in February 1992. Potchefstroom had been held with a majority of 2,000 in the 1989 election. And the Conservative Party, the right-wing party, threw all of its resources into the by-election, and so did the National Party. So this was, was seen as a test in many respects of how the white electorate was responding to the negotiation process so far. Then the Potchefstroom by-election turned out to be a disaster. The National Party's majority of 2000 in 1989 was wiped out and replaced with a Conservative Party majority of over 2000. F.W. de Klerk, this presented a huge challenge to your government. How did you respond? I threw everything I could as leader of the National Party and with all my colleagues into making Potchefstroom a test. And as you've said in your question, yes, in your intro, yes, it turned out that if I were to call out an election the next day after Potchefstroom, in all probability, the National Party would have lost that election. But even before the Potch election, I didn't share it with anybody. I was asking myself this question, what if it goes wrong? And I felt that an election, whether it's a by-election or a general election, people vote for different reasons for certain parties. That the only true test to know whether I still have a mandate to negotiate or not would be a referendum. The night on the day on which the Potts election took place, Many members of the cabinet were at the function offered by Sunlam, which was a yearly institution, this great braai. And I was kept informed every half an hour about how the election in Pot was going. And at the end of the, when the ballot boxes closed, I was told we have lost. So I called David de Villiers, my confident, a minister in my cabinet who was also there, and told him that I think I must call a referendum. Immediately afterwards, of course, Tiernicht and the Conservative Party insisted on a general election. I called my top leadership of the National Party together and said, I'm going to call a referendum. If I put it to the vote, I think I might have lost. But once again, as with the 2nd of February situation, I took the decision to push this through. And I did. And I announced shortly after that, that the by-election would, uh, that the a referendum would be held on the 17th of March, 1992. We've put everything we could into that referendum campaign and we had a wonderful result. In fact, uh, the National Party, or the, the yes vote, won by 69% majority. Correct. And that was on the that was the day before your birthday, so it was a very very nice birthday present. I expected the majority. I I, I wasn't reckless. 
but I thought it would be 52, 53, 54 percent. The 69 percent, so much strength in my hand and the hand of the government to continue with negotiations with a fresh mandate, and it helped us very much. And then the, the formal negotiations commenced uh, in Cadessa 1. Uh, it was very well organized. There were, uh, each delegation had its own uh, experts who could advise, advise it on constitutional questions and other questions. And, and progress was made. Uh, during Cadessa 1, agreement was reached that, as you had said earlier, that there would be an election for a transitional parliament that would legislate during an interim period and that would also sit as a, constitu a constitutional assembly to prepare a final constitution. Because that was always the difference. The, the, the minority parties had all wanted a constitution and then an election, but the ANC insisted there should be an election and then a constitution. But that, of course, would have weakened the position of the minority parties because they would have no say over the final constitution. But this was a wonderful compromise. So there would be an election for an interim parliament. The interim parliament would draw up a final constitution, but it would have to be written within the framework of immutable principles. So it meant that the minority parties had guarantees. And that was basically agreed at Cadessa 1. But then things started going wrong. One got the impression almost that, that there were elements in the ANC that felt that perhaps the ANC had gone too far. What was emerging from this was a liberal democratic constitution, which many of them, particularly the SACP, didn't have in mind. And then all sorts of problems started to emerge in working group two of CADESA, which was the key working group that dealt with constitutional issues. And it was over the majorities that would have to prevail in the approval of the final constitution. The, the process reached a deadlock and the ANC decided to withdraw from, from, from the Cadessa 1 process. On the 15th of May, Cadessa 2 began, but the same problem was encountered with the majorities by which the final constitution would be adopted. At that stage, uh, the whole Cadessa process started to go off the rails. An element within the ANC decided that they would go for rolling mass action. They felt that if they could get enough people into the streets, if they could have constant strikes, constant demonstrations, then the South African government would fall, just as the East German had, government had fallen a few years earlier with similar mass demonstrations. It was called the Leipzig option. What was the government's response to this? The government was extremely worried about the rolling mass action. It had carried with it the possibility of much violence, of many deaths, of blood flowing in the streets. And, but the government was firm in its commitment towards a negotiated, peaceful solution to the problems. We couldn't change the decision of the ANC to walk out and to go on to mass action. We continued to try and maintain open channels and to warn against the dangers involved in their rolling mass action. Getting the message across, we're not going to fold under such pressure. We tried to get them to act responsibly, but they did not. They succeeded in getting masses of people together, big marches in Pretoria and Johannesburg and elsewhere. But we carried on with our work as normal. 
But now all of this was exacerbated by the Boipetong massacre on the 17th of June, the night of the 17th of June, 48 residents of the township of Boipetong near Ferenichang were killed by uh, Festus raiding marauders. The ANC immediately uh, accused the government of having been involved or having not stopped this or Harry having known about it beforehand. You were also uh, horrified and shocked by this development. And I think on the 20th, the Saturday following the massacre, you decided to go to Boipetong to express your condolence to the families. What was your reaction to, to this? And can you tell us about your trip to Boipetong? I was very shocked by the shameless killing of so many innocent people. I decided to go to Boipotong to extend my condolences to the families as the president of the country. I was received by the police. I was taken in with a cavalcade of cars. There was an angry crowd building up. When we reached the designated spot where I would get off to go into a house and to commiserate with the people, the car was almost stormed and the, my security people bundled me back in my car and we had to drive off and I never got to do what I wanted to do. I think the ANC's reaction was extremely unfair and not according to the facts. Fact is, they accused the security forces of being involved. It has been proved in court and in commissions later on that it was members of the IFP, I'm not saying the IFP as an organization, who formed a little band and who went in and in cold blood killed, I think, 48 people. It was terrible. But on this occasion, the security forces weren't involved. It was proved later on. And to this day, the ANC has to admit that they were falsely accusing me, falsely accusing the security forces, and falsely putting the blame on us. It was IFP members angry with the ANC who did this. But nevertheless, the ANC then used Boy Patong as the pretext to cut off all negotiations with the, with the government, to pull out of Cadessa, to make all sorts of extreme demands and to ramp up their rolling mass action. And this finally uh, reached a crisis at the beginning of September when uh, ANC elements decided to march on Bisho, the capital of the Siskai national state. They wanted to kick the, uh, the leader, Brigadier Crozo, out of power. And you pled with Nelson Mandela before the crisis arose, to stop this. What was the reaction? I don't th think he approved of everything. From him, the reaction was, was sort of not a direct reaction. But we used all channels we had. Pog Bota spoke to Bridget de Gozo. Pog Bota spoke to Cyril Ramaphosa. Pug Buddha spoke to many people and others in my channel try to exert as much influence as they can. And then it spilled over. They went to a stadium nearby with Ronnie Casserles storming the capital and with the Siskai police and army taking out their rifles and shooting I think it was 28 people who were killed. But that, I think, uh, was a cathartic moment because at that stage, I think Nelson Mandela realized that if <clears throat> the process continued along this path, it could lead to catastrophe because the extremist in the ANC, the next uh, target would have been a march on Ulundi, the capital of the KwaZulu uh, yeah national state. 
And that would have been catastrophic. So at that stage, it seems as though the ANC wanted to reach out again to the government to see if they could get negotiations going again. Yes, I think the Siskai situation con convinced them that it would be a catastrophe. And therefore, using our back channel, which was never closed between Ruf Meyer and Cyril Ramaphosa, the idea of restarting negotiations became fully alive again. And this resulted in the end in what has become known as the Record of Understanding, which was agreed upon in September 1992. Now, a lot of people, a lot of observers, uh, critics and what have you, say that it was at that moment, with the Record of Understanding on the 26th of September, that the ANC, ANC gained a dominance in the negotiations because it forced the government to accept all of its demands. But its demands actually weren't so out, out of place. Uh, it wanted to have uh, the hostels that were occupied by IFP people fenced and protected, and it wanted to stop uh, uh, demonstrators carrying traditional weapons in the streets. Those were two of the, the, the demands. Uh, the third demand was they wanted to uh, have all of the remaining ANC cadres in prison released, regardless of the seriousness of their crimes, provided only that the motive was a political motive. Now, uh, on the other hand, they agreed to sign off on all of the points that had been agreed to in Cadessa 1 and 2. They agreed to the idea of a, an interim constitution with binding principles. They agreed to the idea of constitutional continuity. They agreed to the idea that uh, there would be a, a, a constitutional state with the supremacy of the law. All of those things that had been included in the Cadessa negotiations. So in many respects, this was actually a victory for those people who wanted to proceed with proper constitutional negotiations. Why do you think the world has misinterpreted this so much? It is difficult to guess why. Fact is, you are right. It's absolutely incorrect to say that we made any constitutional concession at this particular meeting in September 1992. We readopted what has already been agreed. And you are right that it was actually a victory for people truly committed to negotiation. And no concessions were made to the ANC on any fundamental constitutional issue. On the issue of, of fencing in of hostels and of dangerous weapons, I in any event have decided something needed to be done about it because in places it was getting out of hand. But of course that came as a shock to Mr. Butelezi and the IFP. And I realized that uh, there was a danger of them leaving the negotiations. I tried to prevent that by having a meeting with Butelezi by telling my ministers and in the negotiation teams to explain to the IFP why this had to be done. But yes, so it wasn't a concession from my side. Something needed to be done in that field in any of it. It was on the issue of release of prisoners guilty of very serious crimes, like blatant murder that yes, we did make a concession. And the history of that is, I was committed and my government believed we should follow the Norgard principles, which was followed in Namibia, which said that yes, everybody co committing crimes with a political motive would go free, except those where 
premeditation was clearly involved, where it was murder of very serious crimes, and where there was an extremely high element of violence involved. Those were the no God principles. That I supported. But the ANC insisted everybody, as long as it was with a political motive, need to be released. I then dis had discussions with my team. And to my shock, many members in my team said, no, they think we should, we should go the way the ANC wants us to go. What their motives was, whether they thought of their own people who have committed serious crimes in the security forces, who might walk free then, I, I can't prove anything. But fact is, I did not have the support of my own team on this. It was one of the most painful decisions I ever took, was to give in on this and said, okay, the sole test will be, was the crime committed with a political motive? They were only in, interested in ANC people. I insisted, if that is true, it applies to everybody. So that led to the release of, of white people who killed black people in an unacceptable way. But it had to be done to keep negotiation on track. But it was one of the painful, most painful decisions I ever took. And so, with the record of understanding, an important threshold in the negotiations was passed. The ANC had abandoned its attempt to unseat the government by rolling mass action, by doing what the East Germans had done uh, in Leipzig. They'd returned to the negotiations. They had agreed to the basic principles that had been negotiated in Cadessa, and the path was open to continuing the constitu constitutional negotiations in the National Negotiating Forum. But at the same time, the IFP and right-wing parties had now jumped off the negotiating train and wouldn't join until the last days before the 1994 election.